Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and welcome to the first Star Hustler episode ever designed to be used all year long, year after year. You see, the Star Hustler shows you're used to seeing on the air are almost always designed to be good only for the week in which they air, because most of the things in the night sky slowly and constantly change. So there is always something new to see. And it would be impossible to produce Star Hustler episodes to cover all the wonderful, ever-changing cosmic events for years to come. But there are some things in the heavens that although they change every month and with each season, nevertheless do return and repeat year after year. So at the request of you viewers over the past dozen plus years of Star Hustler, we have put together our first series of shows that will be good for years to come. In fact, on this tape, you will not only find 12 episodes, one episode good for each month of the year, but you'll also find as a bonus four extra episodes especially designed for each of the four seasons. And for the most fun, may I suggest this? Don't watch all the episodes at one sitting. Instead, promise yourself to watch only that episode good for the current month and season so that you'll really get to know the Star Hustler cosmic selection for that month and season. Also, so that you'll have something new to look forward to for the next month and each month of the year. And then after a year slips away, do the same thing all over again. And in a couple of years, believe me, you'll be looking forward to the wonderful repeat parade of the heavens overhead. I also promise you that before you know it, you'll see the heavens as as much a part of the change of seasons as the turning of the leaves in autumn and the blossoming of the trees in spring. Indeed, you'll get to know the heavens in a very personal way and share the wonder of generations of our ancestors who counted the beauty of the night sky as much a part of their lives as the ever-changing sights of daytime. And please, don't file this tape away. Keep it out close to your VCR so that you'll always be ready to view the next episode as each month of the year comes up. And so that you never miss the weekly changing parade of the cosmos, simply tune in to each new episode of Star Hustler every week on your local PBS station. And then walk out into the night to experience the secret wonders of the universe shared by all of us who know and love to keep looking up. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode for spring is Time Travel Through the Big Dipper. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and all throughout springtime in early evening, the most famous and best-loved star pattern of all, the Big Dipper can be found riding high above the North Star. To find it any night in early evening in spring, simply go outside just after dark and look due north. And there you'll see it either directly above or slightly to either side of the North Star. Now, since I was a kid, I've always been fascinated with the concept of time travel. And of course, when we look at the stars, we're literally looking back in time because the stars are so far away that the light we see from them left them a long time ago. In fact, the stars are so incredibly far away 
that we measure their distance with a special term, a measure of distance we call a light year, which is simply the number of miles light travels in one year. And incredibly, light travels 186,000 miles per second. Thus, one light year equals six trillion miles. Well, many years ago, I decided I'd find out and memorize the distance to each star in the Big Dipper. Let me show you from the closest to the farthest. Now, the star at the bend of the handle, Mizar, is 60 light years away, which means that when we look at Mizar, we see it as it actually existed 60 years ago. The star next to it and one of the cup stars are each 62 light years away. And the star where the handle attaches is 65 light years distant. We see the two remaining cup stars as they existed 75 years ago. And if you've got really good eyes, you can see that the star in the bend of the handle is really two stars. The dimmer star being 80 light years away. Well, as I said, I tried to memorize these distances, but somehow they slipped out of my brain like water out of a dipper. Until one night recently, it dawned on me that with the exception of the star at the end of the handle, all the dipper stars are between 60 and 80 light years away, a 20-year time span, corresponding roughly to the last quarter of a person's lifetime. And as I looked up, it struck me as being almost poetic that these stars, the very first stars we learn about as a child, we don't really see until we reach the last years of our lives. For although they were shining brightly on the night we were born, we have to wait a lifetime to see them as they actually existed way back then. So next time you look up at the Big Dipper, remind yourself, if you are still young, that someday you will see these stars as they actually were when you first appeared on this planet. And if you're not so young, delight in the thought that you are looking back at some of the few things that actually appear exactly as they were in those sunlit days and star-filled nights of youth. And what about that star at the end of the handle of the dipper? Well, that's the exception. It's 110 light years away, which gives us all a star to grow on. So happy stargazing and keep looking up. Star Hustler made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode for the month of March is Here's Mud in Your Eye and a Bit of Sunshine Too. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And as you all know, the third week of March, as regular as clockwork, our sun crosses that imaginary line called the celestial equator, thus officially marking the vernal equinox, the first moment of the first day of spring. And this year is no exception. And as I do every year at this time, I would like to recite my favorite welcome springtime poem. Spring has sprung. The grass has riz. I wonder where the birdies is. <laughs> now that that's finished, I assure you that you've got a whole year before you hear that little gem of wisdom again. <laughs> at any rate, at this time of year, at mid-latitudes in the northern hemisphere, the first day of spring 
is often accompanied by the softening of the Earth's surface, which brings with it, if the snows are melting, good old-fashioned mud. And if you've ever driven down a backwoods path during mud time, then you'll know where that expression, here's mud in your eye, or windshield, came from. But in addition to bringing us mud in our eye, the equinox also brings us sun in our eye, because there are only two times in the year when the sun rises directly east and sets directly west. And that is on the first day of spring and the first day of fall, the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox. And you can prove it to yourself each beginning of spring and autumn. That is, during the third week of March and the third week of September, if you happen to be driving in a car on a highway that goes directly east and west. In fact, you can check to see just how truly east and west a supposed east-west highway is oriented. Because if you drive to work just before sunrise on a due east route, the sun will rise directly over the yellow line in the middle of the road. And if you drive home on an east-west route, traveling west, just as the sun sets, you will notice that the sun indeed sets directly over the yellow line in the middle of the road. Now, where I live in South Florida, I frequently take an east-west route called Sunset Drive to and from work. And believe me, when I drive home at sunset on the equinoxes, everybody's got their visors down. In fact, I wonder how many of you out there have ever wondered why it is that sometimes on certain roads that you regularly travel, the sun gets to you in the eyes to the point of distraction. I mean, most people are so busy with their ordinary, everyday things of life that they rarely have time even to think about such things. But you know, the workings of nature, especially of the heavenly bodies such as the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars, really do affect our everyday existence. And at the time of the equinoxes, this is vividly and squarely brought right home and hits us smack dab right in the eye. So, fellow star, planet, moon, and sometimes sun gazers, get out your dark glasses, man those visors, and here's mud and sunshine in your eye. And whatever you do in the meantime, remember, keep lugging up. Star Hustler, made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, Star Hustler. Director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode, good for the month of April, is The Big Dipper, The Bare Facts. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and how would you like to take a close look at the most famous star pattern of them all? The Big Dipper. A dipper is simply a cup with a long handle on it, something like a ladle. And our big sky dipper has seven bright stars, four of which make the cup and three of which make the handle. Now, the reason it's so famous is probably because it's the closest bright star pattern to the North Star. And for several hundred years, navigators have used the two end stars in the dipper to find the North Star. And you can, too. Simply shoot an arrow through the two end cup stars, and you'll land almost directly on the North Star. 
Now, in early evening, every April and May, the Big Dipper is always very prominent above the North Star, being a little northeast in early evening April and a little to the northwest in early evening May. Now, when I was a kid, I remember us saying that in April, the Dipper turned upside down so that its water poured directly on the ground so that April Dipper showers would bring May flowers. But the Big Dipper is a rather new name for these stars. For historically, for thousands of years, these stars and those close by have been called Ursa Major, which is Latin for the greater bear. The ancient Greek called these stars Arctos Megala, which also means the greater bear, and is where we get our word Arctic from, the country of the bear. Now, the arrangement of these stars does not really suggest the picture of a bear, unless we stretch our imagination. Yet, this constellation has been known as a bear by civilizations so widely separated as to preclude, at least some say, any possibility of communication. Now, in the springtime, the bear is upside down, and the standard picture is something like this. The cup becomes the body of the bear and the handle the tail. We can clearly see three legs, each of which has two toes and a large thick neck and a modified triangle for a head. But not everyone pictured the bear this way. For even though the American Indians called these stars a bear, they said the three stars of the Dipper's handle were the three Indian braves chasing the bear. The ancient Arabs, however, before adopting the modern concept of a bear, called these stars a beer, a coffin with three attendants. And the Babylonians called this the long chariot, an image which lasted through the time of Charles I of England when the Big Dipper was called Charles Wayne, which means Charles Wagon. And interestingly, even today, the Japanese still called the Big Dipper the Emperor's carriage. Personally, I'm partial to one of the most ancient of all sky images that says that the three handle stars are the three golden apples which Hercules sought to find. And indeed, right now when these three stars are highest in early evening in spring, Hercules is just rising in the east and seems about to begin his magic pursuit once again. So, out under the heavens with you for the bare fun of looking up. Star Hustler, made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, Star Hustler. Director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode good for the month of May is The Legendary Southern Cross and Mark Twain's Impossible Dream. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and I wish I had a dollar for every person who's asked me how to find the Southern Cross. Because, although the Southern Cross is a very famous pattern of stars, it is, nevertheless, the smallest constellation of them all, and one of the most difficult to find from the North American continent. In this episode, however, I will show you how, when, and where to find it. Now, the Southern Cross is one of those few constellations that looks very much like its name. It's much tinier than the Northern Cross. And to show you how much smaller, I've taken the liberty of placing both the Northern and the Southern Crosses side by side. 
And as you can see, the Northern Cross has more visible stars than its smaller brother. But, to my way of thinking, the Southern Cross is more exquisite because its stars are brighter and it looks like a, a little gem set in the southern sky. Its official name is Crooks, which is Latin for cross. And one story says that Magellan, the first European to sail south of the equator, discovered it and used it to save his neck. For in his time, all ship captains steered by the stars. And once he crossed south of the equator, the most important navigational star, the North Star, disappeared. And as he traveled farther and farther south, more and more of the familiar European constellations disappeared. Until at one point, when the skies seemed to be filled with strange new stars, his sailors mutinied because they thought that they were about to sail off the end of the earth. Magellan, however, being rather bright and realizing that his crew was very superstitious, seized upon the idea of using these four bright stars to his advantage and told his crew that these four bright stars made a perfect cross and were a sign from heaven to continue their journey through these unknown seas to bring the cross to new and unknown peoples. For by lucky coincidence, the very sails of Magellan's ships carried the symbol of the cross. Another story, less reverent, concerns Mark Twain and the small star called Epsilon Crucis, which is about halfway between Alpha and Delta Crucis. Twain, it is said, had a very low opinion of this star because he said its appearance here ruined the almost perfect symmetry of the Southern Cross. In fact, he said he was going to write to his congressman to see if Congress couldn't get it moved to the very center of the cross where it would look much, much better. Now, to find the Southern Cross, simply go outside just after it gets dark any clear night from the first week of May through the first week of June. And there you'll see it standing upright, smack dab right on the southern horizon. That is, if you happen to be any place in North America, south of about 26 degrees north latitude, which means all of you who live on a line south of Miami and Hawaii. And did you know that the Southern Cross is the only star pattern which appears in the flag of a major country? Three of them, in fact. Have fun figuring out which ones as you remember to keep looking up. Star Hustler was made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode for summer is Season of the Dolphin. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And you know, whenever someone mentions the stars of summer, Scorpius, Sagittarius, and the Summer Triangle usually come to mind. And every summer, for many years, I have always zeroed in on these particular summer star patterns because they are so big and bright and easy to find. But one of my favorite summer star patterns is one of the tiniest of them all, and it isn't very bright. But it's worth hunting for because it is one of those exquisite, 
gems of the cosmos. And you'll have no problem finding it and knowing where to find it if you just remember this phrase, three birds and a dolphin. Because the dolphin always follows the three birds that make up the summer triangle across the roof of heaven all summer long. Now, every year on the first day of summer, I kind of unofficially declare it cosmic bird and dolphin season. And I make it a point to go outside at least once a week around 10 p.m. to watch the progress of these special stars as they rise higher and higher week after week month after month. Now, if you go outside at 10 p.m. your local time this summer and any summer during the first week of summer, that is the last week of June, you'll see three bright stars, which if you could draw lines between them would make a huge triangle, the summer triangle. And each of these three bright stars is the major star of a summer sky bird. Aquila the eagle, Cygnus the Swan and Lyra the Harp, which doesn't sound very bird-like, but which in some cultures long ago was indeed a winged creature. Then, remembering that the dolphin always follows these three summer birds, simply look behind them, that is, below the summer triangle, and there you will see the tiny star pattern that is the summer dolphin. Then, week after week, if you go out always around 10 p.m. your local daylight time, you will see that these birds and the dolphin have climbed higher in the heavens. By the middle of July at 10 p.m., the beginning of August 10 p.m., the middle of August 10 p.m., the end of August 10 p.m., and by mid-September, during the last week of summer, the dolphin at 10 p.m., will reach its highest point above the horizon, smack dab on an imaginary line which goes from due north across the very top of the sky down to due south. Once again, the summer triangle and the dolphin, the first week of summer, the middle of July, the end of July, the middle of August, the end of August, and the last week of summer. Now, because the dolphin stars are not very bright, make sure that you look for it on a night when there's very little moonlight, preferably when you're away from city lights. And once you've found it, I know that it will become something you'll look for and treasure every summer of your life. Oh, I do love the easy-to-find bright stars, but there's something to be said for the magic of the almost hidden, less obvious sky treasures. So, out under the heavens with you in this season of the dolphin, and to find it, remember, keep looking up. Star Hustler was made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, Star Hustler. Director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode for the month of June is Why is a Honeymoon Called a Honeymoon? And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And have you ever wondered why a honeymoon is called a honeymoon? Does a honeymoon have anything to do with honey or the moon? Well, the answer to both is yes. You see, the word month comes directly from the word moon. So the term honeymoon originally meant honey month, perhaps because the first month of marriage, theoretically, is supposed to be about the sweetest time of anyone's life. 
It has also been suggested that the honeymoon is so called because of an ancient custom in some European countries where the wedded couple drank honey wine every day for the first month of marriage. Honey, of course, is also a term of endearment and is said to date back to at least 1350. Pretty old honey, if you ask me. Another suggestion is that the term honeymoon is a corruption of an old word for wedding songs. But one of my favorite explanations has to do with astronomy, because June is the favorite month for marriage, and the color of the summer moon is much different than in any other season. It is indeed a honey gold. And you can check it out for yourself during the full moon of June and July. And what's more, I'll give you the reason why the summer full moon is a honey-colored moon. Now, we all know that the sun rides highest across the sky in summer and lowest in winter. But the opposite is true of the moon. The moon rides highest across the sky in winter and lowest across the sky in summer. But this applies only to the full moon. Now, if you can remember what a full moon looks like in winter, it rides very high across the top of the heavens and looks very white and very cold and floods a snowy landscape with dazzling brilliance. But in the summer, just the opposite occurs. And the full moon rides so low that it looks much bigger and turns to a honey gold. Now, the reason it looks bigger is an illusion. For when the moon is low, we see it closer to objects on the landscape, trees and buildings, etc. And this close relationship fools the eye into thinking the moon is bigger than it really is. The same thing happens to the sun when it's close to the horizon. But the reason the moon changes color when it's low in the sky is because then we look at it through denser and more polluted layers of atmosphere. And it is this thicker atmosphere acting kind of like a color filter that makes the moon seem to change color. Another illusion. But how appropriate, for it might be said that the honeymoon is one of the most magnificent illusions of them all. Indeed, Astronomer Guy Otwell suggests that no sooner is the moon full than it begins to wane. And with that, this is Jack Horkheimer, your cynical mood hustler, reminding you to keep looking up. Star Hustler, made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, Star Hustler director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode, good for the month of July and early August, is hook a star cluster or two. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and quick like a bunny, think of a star cluster. Now, if you're like most people, you'll either say, how should I know, or the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. And even I have to admit that the Pleiades is the first thing I think of whenever someone mentions a star cluster. In fact, the Pleiades, that is, the Seven Sisters, is probably my favorite star cluster. But strictly speaking, 
it's an autumn star cluster, meaning that it is visible in early evening during autumn. But since there's a lot more casual stargazing during the summertime because of summer vacations, it would be nice to have a star cluster visible for early evening viewing while it's still shirt sleeve weather. And would you believe not only do we have one star cluster for your early evening summer viewing, we have two. And the most convenient time for viewing these two star clusters in early August is just after the sun has gone down and it's gotten completely dark out. Because then these two star clusters will be highest above the horizon. And they're easy to find because you can literally catch them with a hook. So let's show you how to hook a couple of cosmic clusters. Simply go outside around 9 p.m. your local daylight savings time during the first two weeks of August of any year and look due south. And there you'll see a great group of stars, which if we could draw lines between them, would look like a giant cosmic fish hook. In fact, the early Polynesians claimed that this giant skyhook was actually used to lift the Hawaiian Islands up out of the depths of the ocean. Indeed, in many cultures, this constellation has been seen and is seen as a great hook. But we in Western civilization have referred to it for thousands of years as Scorpius, a giant sky scorpion, with the end of the fish hook being the scorpion's vicious stinger. Now, the clusters we seek lay just above the tip of the stinger. The cluster closest to the stinger is called M7, and just above it is M6. And although they don't look like it, they actually are star clusters just like the Pleiades. So, why don't they look like the Pleiades? Well, you guessed it, because they're so far away. You see, the Pleiades are only 400 light years away, but M7 is exactly twice as far, 800 light years. So, if we could push the Pleiades out into space, 400 more light years away, it would look very much like M7 looks to us now. And M6 is even farther away, over three times farther than the Pleiades, at the incredible distance of 1,300 light years beyond. Now, to see M6 and M7, make sure it's a dark, moonless night and that you have no city lights wiping out the sky. Then, with the naked eye, they'll look like two faint cosmic Q-tips. But if you take even the cheapest pair of binoculars and look at M6 and M7, they'll almost knock your socks off because each cluster is composed of over 50 suns. So, out under the heavens with you, to hook a cosmic cluster as you keep looking up. Star Hustler is made possible by the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Abraham Schwartz Estate, the Rosenberg Foundation, and the patrons of the Miami Museum of Science and Space Transit Planetarium. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode, good for the month of August, is Yes, Virginia, there really is a Milky Way. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and I couldn't count the number of times I've mentioned our galaxy. And in this episode, I'll not only talk about our galaxy, I'll actually show you how to see a lot of it at its very best, which coincidentally happens to be during the month of August. Now, when we look up at the constellation Andromeda, we can see a fuzzy patch of light. And if we look at this fuzzy patch of light through a telescope, it looks like a giant spiral pinwheel. 
And we now know that this spiral pinwheel is a humongous family of suns, many of them just like our own sun, many larger, many smaller, about a hundred billion suns with all of the trillions of planets that undoubtedly go with them. And we call this family of suns a galaxy. Now, it is currently believed that the family of suns, that is the galaxy of suns to which we belong, looks very much like the spiral galaxy in Andromeda. Although there is currently some talk that the center of our galaxy might be shaped a bit differently. At any rate, we know that our sun is simply one of over a hundred billion suns that make up our Milky Way galaxy. And our sun is located about two thirds of the way out from the center in one of the spiral arms. Now, since we are inside our galaxy looking out, it would seem logical that if we looked toward the rim of our galaxy, that we should see a lot more stars than if we looked up through the top of our galaxy or down through the bottom of it. And it would also seem logical that if we look directly toward the center of our galaxy, where the stars are concentrated most densely, that we should see the most stars. And such is the case. But most of the stars in our galaxy are so incredibly far away from us that they don't show up as individual points of light. Indeed, whenever we look towards the rim or the center of our galaxy, all the light of the billions of stars fuzzes together in a blur. But we can see this blur, and people have been fascinated with it for thousands upon thousands of years. We call this blur of light, which looks like a ribbon of dim light stretched across the sky, the Milky Way. And early evening August is about the best time of the year to get the best view of the Milky Way as seen from our position inside it. All you have to do to see it is get far, far away from city lights and all artificial lighting of any kind and have a clear moonless night. For even the bright light of the moon wipes out the dim glow of the Milky Way. So any moonless night in early evening August, that is around 9 to 10 o'clock your local time, simply go outside. And if it's clear and you're far away from any lights, you will see it stretched from the northeast horizon directly across the zenith overhead and down to the horizon due south. And if you take a good pair of binoculars or a small telescope and aim it at the Milky Way, you will see what looks like millions of tiny specks. And believe it or not, each tiny speck is a distant sun, perhaps with its own family of worlds. Yes, indeed, there really is a Milky Way, invisible from cities because of city lights, but it's there, and it's beautiful. And in August, it's just waiting to be seen if you remember to keep looking up. Star Hustler is made possible by the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Abraham Schwartz Estate, the Rosenberg Foundation, and the patrons of the Miami Museum of Science and Space Transit Planetarium. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode for autumn is Season Without Giants or Time of the Quiet Sky. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and if you're one of those people who loves the change of the seasons, have you ever wondered whether the sky changes seasons too? Well, if so, then don't touch that dial, because in this episode, I'll let you in on some of the secrets of the seasons of the heavens, and how you can double your pleasure, not only by watching the face of the earth change seasons, 
but also by watching the face of the night sky likewise metamorphose. You see, it all has to do with our Earth's yearly journey in its orbit around the sun. Because as our Earth makes its annual journey around the sun, it faces a different part of the starry sky each successive evening. So that if you go outside every night at the same time, let's say after sunset, for a year, you will notice that the various constellations slowly but regularly change their positions in the heavens, being sometimes very prominent and high up in early evening, and at other times completely gone from the heavens. Now, when astronomers talk about sky seasons, they mean that the particular star patterns or constellations of any season are those that are very high above the horizon in early evening hours during that given season. For instance, in summertime, we know that the Great Summer Triangle and the Giant Scorpion are always very high and dominant in early evening summer skies. And in winter in early evening, the Giant Orion and his great dog always ride high and dominate winter's landscape. Springtime always has its huge Leo the Lion and the Big Dipper towering overhead in early evening. But there is one season when the sky becomes quiet, a season when there are fewer bright stars visible than any other time of year. And quite appropriately, I think, that season is autumn, the season when the earth, too, is quieting down, a season of muted sun and starlight a season without celestial giants, the season of the soft sky. And if you do what I'm about to show you on at least one October evening, every October for the rest of your life, you will add yet another dimension to your enjoyment of the exquisite feelings that autumn brings. Simply go outside any October evening just after the sun has gone down and look for the giant summer scorpion as he sets low in the southwest. Then, in the hours before midnight, you will see for yourself the softest of skies with a minimum of bright stars, a time when you'll be able to delight in the exquisite beauty of an eastward rising seven sisters. Then, around midnight, the autumn season skies will slowly give way to a preview of winter as Orion, the winter giant, boldly rises in the southeast. How fitting, how poetic that the sky seasons coincidentally match our Earth's as regular as clockwork. Yes, for each and every October of your life, summer's scorpion sets at sunset and winter's Orion arises at midnight. But the hours in between are like the palette of a celestial impressionist. So get the outside under the heavens softly and remember to keep looking up. Star Hustler is made possible by the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Abraham Schwartz Estate, the Rosenberg Foundation, and the patrons of the Miami Museum of Science and Space Transit Planetarium. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode, good for the month of September, is Vega, real time travel to the near future. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and I'm sure that you or I could not even begin to name the number of books, movies, or TV shows that have time travel as the premise. And, of course, whenever anybody tries to look into the future, they usually end up being 
wrong. However, there are a few things about the future that we can predict with extreme accuracy. And one of those things is shining like a brilliant beacon almost overhead in early evening in early September. Let me show you. Simply go outside between 9 and 10 o'clock, your local time, any clear night during the first week of September, and look due north. And if you draw an imaginary line from the due north horizon up to the zenith, you will see a brilliant blue-white star almost smack dab on that line and close to overhead. And that star is the third brightest star we can see from the northern hemisphere, the star called Vega which is the brightest of the three stars that make up the summer triangle. And when I say Vega is bright, I mean bright. Because if we could take our sun and put it in Vega's place, we wouldn't even be able to see it unless we were standing on a mountain peak on a moonless night far away from city lights. Indeed, Vega is five and a half thousand degrees hotter than our sun. But one of the most interesting things about Vega has to do with our Earth's wobble and the North Star. You see, the North Star is the end star of the handle of the Little Dipper. And we call it the North Star because our Earth's axis is pointed almost directly at it. Now, because our Earth is always turning on its axis from west to east, this gives us the illusion that the stars move in the opposite direction, from east to west, around the North Star. In fact, if you go outside any night and spend several hours outside, you will see that all the stars seem to circle around the North Star, slowly rising in the east, traveling across the sky, and eventually setting in the west. But our North Star won't always be the North Star because our Earth wobbles on its axis like a top slowing down. And if the Earth's axis were a gigantic pencil, we would see that it traces a complete circle on the sky once every 26,000 years. Thus, our Earth's axis constantly and slowly moves and points to different stars as it traces this imaginary circle on the sky. In the year 3000 BC, even before the pyramids were built, our Earth's axis pointed to Thuban, the brightest star in Draco the Dragon. And when Tutankhamun ruled Egypt, the star at the end of the cup of the Little Dipper was the North Star. And now, over 3,000 years later, the star at the end of the handle is our North Star. But as time passes like the hand on a giant sky clock, Eventually, Earth's axis will slowly drift to the brightest north star of them all. Brilliant, blue-white, Vega. But don't hold your breath, because that won't happen until the year 13,500 A.D. So, out out of the heavens with you between 9 and 10 o'clock in early September to catch a glimpse of what we know is part of the future, and remember... Now is a good time to keep looking up. Star Hustler is made possible by the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Abraham Schwartz Estate, the Rosenberg Foundation, and the patrons of the Miami Museum of Science and Space Transit Planetarium. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode, created especially for the entire month of October, is Heavenly Southern Fried Fish, Frog or Ostrich, and the Ancient Center of the Universe. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers, and this week I'm going to tell you a heavenly fish story 
and in the process show you how to find, easy as pie, a very bright star with a fascinating past and present. The star is the brightest object visible as you look approximately due south any clear night this October around 10 p.m. your local daylight saving time. Its name is Fomalot, and it's easy for me to remember because if I put too much soap in my washing machine, it most certainly will foam a lot. However, its name is much older than any automatic washer by several hundred years. It comes from an Arabic phrase which means the fish's mouth, which is quite appropriate because it is the brightest star in Pisces Austrinus, which simply means the southern fish. And once again, to find it, all you have to do is go outside any clear night this week around 10 p.m., your local daylight savings time, and it will be due south just above the horizon. Now, as you look at Fulham a lot, you will notice that on many nights, it will appear to twinkle more than the other stars, which is due to our viewing it through denser layers of our Earth's atmosphere close to the horizon. And because there are practically no other stars near it, Fomalot is sometimes called the loneliest star in the heavens and adds a touch of melancholy to these autumn skies. We can tell from Fomalot's white color that it is hotter than our own star, the sun, because our sun is yellow-orange and white stars are always hotter than orange ones. Remember that phrase, white hot? Now, Fomalot is also much larger than our own sun, twice as large, as a matter of fact, being almost two million miles wide. And if you turn 21 years old this year, then the light you see from Fomalot this week is the light that left it the year you were born because Fomalot is only 21 light years away. And think about this as you look at Fomalot this week. 5,000 years ago, the ancient Persians regarded this star as one of the four most important stars of the heavens. And in 500 BC, it was actually worshiped in the temple of the goddess of fertility in ancient Greece. And Less than 200 years ago, the astronomer Bogoslavsky believed that it was the central sun of the entire universe. My, how times have changed, for we now know that it is one of the closest stars to our planet Earth. So, out under the heavens with you to catch a cosmic fish, which historically was called by some civilizations an ostrich, and a frog. Put that in your southern fried cooker as you keep looking up. Star Hustler was made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, Star Hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. Our episode for this week is A Sky Full of Birds for Thanksgiving and the Moon of the Frosty Beavers. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. 
Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And if you notice it getting a little bit nippy when you go out to do your stargazing, you're not alone. Because even the sky lore of the American Indians lets everyone know that this is that time of year when you better put on an extra buckskin or two if you're going to go out star or boot gazing. In fact, the full moon of November is traditionally called the Frosty Moon and the Beaver Moon. Because as winter approaches, this is the month when beavers are very active preparing for the long cold season. Indeed, if anyone needs a beaver coat at this time of the year, it's the humble beaver itself. But enough about beavers, because this show is really for the birds. Or at least about birds, because this is that time of year when almost everyone in America has a bird of some kind or other on the Thanksgiving table. Now, traditionally, that bird in America is the turkey. But stargazers have a much larger choice of Thanksgiving birds, because if you go outside any clear night Thanksgiving week, just after sunset, and look to the northwest, you'll see three bright stars, which, if connected by lines, make up what is officially called the Summer Triangle which at this time of year I unofficially call the Autumn Triangle. And these three stars are all connected throughout history to heavenly birds. Now, the star farthest east is Deneb, the bright tail star in Cygnus the Swan. So in addition to our Thanksgiving turkey, we now have a cosmic swan to be thankful for. The star farthest to the west, Altair, is the brightest star in a heavenly eagle. Roast eagle, anyone? No. The bright star closest to the northwest horizon is Vega, the brightest star in Lyra the Harp, which is strangely more bird-like than the other two put together. You see, Lyra was not always a harp. In fact, before it was a lyre, it was a turtle. But before it was a turtle, you guessed it, Lyra was a bird. And ancient records state that Lyra's association with a bird originated perhaps with a sky figure popular for thousands of years in ancient India. The figure of a great cosmic vulture. Also long, long ago as the great Babylonian kings and their queens walked under the night sky through the great hanging gardens of Babylon, they looked overhead and identified Lyra with their great mythical storm bird, Uraka. And throughout the great Arabian deserts, Caravans referred to Lyra as the wonderful, swooping stone eagle of the desert. However, it is also said that some Arabian authors referred to Lyra not as an eagle, but as a cosmic goose, which in my estimation is a bit more tasty for anyone's Thanksgiving banquet. But good old Lyra has seen other feathery incarnations and has also been known as an osprey, and a wood falcon. Anyone care for an osprey or wood falcon drumstick? <laughs> At any rate, it's only in the past couple of hundred of years or so that we see Lyra exclusively as a harp. For as short a time ago as the American Revolution, these stars were depicted as an eagle with a lyre in its beak. Perhaps as a musical accompaniment to a Thanksgiving feast? <laughs> At any rate, by Thanksgiving weekend, if you've had turkey up to here, well, simply go outside for some birds of a different feather. And thank heaven you'll never get them in your leftovers. And with that, I think I'll get myself a hot dog while you all keep looking up. Star Hustler, made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode for winter is a sensational celestial six-pack. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. 
Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And you know, I always refer to the autumn sky as the quiet sky because there are fewer bright stars in the heavens in early evening in autumn than any other time of the year. But if autumn is quiet by lack of its brilliance, then winter is a 21 gun and brass band salute. Because in early evening in winter, over one third of the 20 brightest stars are visible. And I'd like to show you an easy way to find them. We'll start with what I call the sensational celestial six pack. And all you have to do is go outside any clear December or January night from 9 p.m. to midnight and look east southeast and use Orion the Hunter as your starting point. Simply take the three stars in Orion's belt and shoot an imaginary arrow through them down toward the horizon. And that arrow will land smack dab on the brightest star visible to the naked eye, the star called Sirius, the eye of the great dog, sparkling away like a brilliant blue-white diamond, out dazzling all the other stars in the heavens. And while you're looking at Sirius, think of this. While the closest star, our sun, is a million miles wide, breathtaking Sirius is twice its size. But that's just a start. Because if we hang a left at Sirius and draw an imaginary line over to the next brightest star, we'll land on Procyon, the eye of the not-so-great dog. And while Procyon is bigger than Sirius, it is not as bright because it is a different type of star. Next, if we draw a line at a slight angle up from Procyon, we come to the brightest star of Gemini, the star called Pollux, which is a humongous 11 times as wide as our sun, but so far away that it looks even dimmer than closer for Cyan and Sirius. Then, if we make a sharper angle and aim our line up into the heavens, we come to Capella, a star that really fools the eye, because Capella is not one, but two stars that blend their light together. One of Capella's stars is three times the size of our sun, the other is seven times as wide. Next, we make an almost right angle and shoot across the heavens toward the reddish star Aldebaran, which is even larger than Capella, Pollux, Procyon, and Sirius put together. In fact, Aldebaran is 40 times as wide as our sun. But you ain't seen nothing yet because we make one more turn and head back for Orion to his bright knee star called Rigel, which is over 50 times as wide as our sun. Then we shoot another arrow back to our starting point, Sirius. And by now you can see that we've formed an almost perfect hexagon, a six-sided figure, in the sky. But like a baker's dozen, which is 13, our star hustler six-pack also has an additional star which is almost at the center of our hexagon. And it is, ta-da, the super giant red shoulder star called Betelgeuse, which is bigger than the other six put together. Indeed, Betelgeuse is over 900 times as wide as our sun. Wow, seven of the 20 brightest stars in a huddle. Now that's what I call a super six-pack. Looks great, and it's not filling, so keep looking up. Star Hustler is made possible by the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Abraham Schwartz Estate, the Rosenberg Foundation, and the patrons of the Miami Museum of Science and Space Transit Planetarium. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode for the month of December is The Cross and the Manger, a Christmas gift from the stars. And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, 
your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And this week, I'd like to share with you a fascinating discovery I made in December of 87 about the stars of Christmas week. A story many viewers have asked me to retell. It happened by accident as I was searching for something unusual for my Christmas week show. And strangely, it started with the summer star pattern, Cygnus the Swan, a star pattern which rises in the east just after sunset in July. Now, Cygnus has always enchanted me because it looks so much like its name, a graceful swan, its tail marked by one bright star, its beak by another, a star for the tip of the left wing and a star for the tip of the right wing, stars which, if we draw lines between them, represent a swan with outstretched wings. In my youth, I, I always loved to watch Cygnus rise in the east on summer evenings and climb higher and higher, till at midnight he appeared with wings outstretched across the very roof of heaven. Then, after midnight, he would slowly descend, gliding downward to the western horizon. Now, one thing that fascinated me about Cygnus was that as he approached the western horizon, he seemed to change his shape, looking more like a star pattern the early Christians called the Northern Cross. Now, it takes very little imagination to see that if we just clip off the wingtip of each wing, then the line between the wings becomes a cross piece, and the line between the beak and the tail becomes the upright of the cross. It also seemed interesting to me that every year during Christmas week, in early evening, around 8 p.m. or so, that this cross stands almost upright on the northwest horizon, which you can see for yourself any clear night this week. But in December of 87, as I was doing research for my Christmas show, the little star custer called the beehive caught my attention and jogged a memory, for I recalled that the beehive's real name is Praesipi, which in Latin literally means the manger. And I said to myself, wouldn't it be nice if at Christmas time we could see the manger at the same time we see the cross? Well, just for fun, I picked up my star wheel and dialed in December 25th, 8 p.m. and noticed something for the first time in my life, something which gave me a pleasant start. For there on the wheel at 8 p.m. on the 25th of December was not only the Northern Cross standing upright on the western horizon getting ready to set, but directly opposite on the eastern horizon, just barely rising, was Praesipi, the manger. And I further discovered that it is only during Christmas week, between the hours of 8 and 9 p.m., when you will see these two objects in the sky at the same time together. In all my years as a stargazer, I had never heard or read of this lovely, almost poetic coincidence. So, fellow stargazers, as you gaze up at the night sky this week, may the heavens themselves remind you of a wish that should know no religious boundaries and should be the deepest hope of us all. And that simply is peace on earth to men of goodwill. And, might I add, keep looking up. Star Hustler, made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, Star Hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode, good for the month of January, is Incredible Caster, the Sensational Sibling.
now here to tell you all about tonight's sky. And the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And if you've ever wanted to find the constellation Gemini, the twins, January and February are good months to do so. For all you have to do is go outside after it gets dark out and look toward the east during early evening hours. And there you'll see two stars very close to each other, separated by five degrees. About the same distance as between the two stars in the end of the cup of the Big Dipper. And these two brightest stars of Gemini are named for the ancient set of twins, Castor and Pollux. Pollux being the brighter twin and Castor the dimmer. Even though Castor is less bright than his brother to the naked eye, he nevertheless is far more than he appears to be. For, while less obvious on first inspection, he becomes absolutely incredible when viewed through a telescope. For Dim Castor is without a doubt the sensational sibling, a star that almost blows my mind every time I look at it and think about it. Indeed, if you look at Castor through a fair-sized telescope, you will see that Castor is not just one star, but two. Now, the astronomer Cassini, for whom the gaps in the rings of Saturn are named, noticed that Castor was two stars as far back as 1678. But it wasn't until 1803 that Sir William Herschel, the discoverer of Uranus, also discovered that Castor and its companion star are actually physically related to each other and revolve about each other in space like the planets do around our sun. The first such binary star system ever discovered. And each star is roughly one and a half to two times the diameter of our own sun, separated from each other by about the distance of the diameter of our entire solar system, eight billion miles. And would you believe it takes these two stars four centuries to make one revolution around each other? And to top it off, sometime later, yet another star was discovered. A third companion named Castor C, a faint red dwarf star which revolves around the other two, not once every 400 years, but once every 10,000 years. But that's only the beginning, because with a special instrument called a spectroscope, it was further discovered that the three stars, Castor A, Castor B, and Castor C, which we see as just one star with a naked eye, each themselves has a companion star. Thus, when you go outside this month after it gets dark and look east at the stars Castor and Pollux, the two brightest stars in Gemini the Twins, you will be looking not at just two stars, but at seven. The more prominent Pollux, one brother, and the dimmer Castor, not one, but six sensational siblings. And as you contemplate this incredible piece of the cosmos, do what I do whenever I look at Castor. Try to imagine in your mind's eye the incredibly intricate and exquisitely synchronized waltz of the six suns. Six stars moving in magnificent orbital procession around each other. The heavens are wonderful and sometimes they are sensational. See if you can feel this celestial magic. It's easy if you just remember to keep looking up. Star Hustler made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Some people hustle pool, some people hustle cars. But have you ever heard about the man who hustles stars? Jack Horkheimer, star hustler, director of the Miami Space Transit Planetarium. This episode, good for the month of February, is three stars you'll love to pronounce. Alnatak, Alnalam, and Mintaka.
And now here to tell you all about tonight's sky and the biggest show of all, the universe, your star hustler, Jack Horkheimer. Greetings, greetings, fellow stargazers. And this week, let's take a behind-the-scenes look at the three stars which make up the belt of Orion the Hunter. Three stars which historically have been called everything from the three magi to the three dancers, from Jacob's rod to Mary's wand, from Lord Nelson to Napoleon, even according to Laplander legend, a great celestial saloon. It's no wonder they've been called so many things down through the ages, because they are so obvious to the naked eye, they almost beg to be named. Now, to find the three belt stars of Orion, simply go outside any clear night this month, around 8 to 10 p.m. your local time, and look south, and there you'll see the three stars, equally spaced in a row. Their real names, the ones we use today, are from left to right, that is from east to west, on the talk, on the lam, and min taka. Now, I don't know why, but I just love to say those words. To me, they're kind of the celestial equivalent of Mersey dotes and dozy dotes. Once again, on the talk, on the lam, and min taka. Now, on the talk comes from the Arabic word for girdle, an item of clothing we don't hear much about anymore, and one I'm seriously considering buying. And right next to al natak the girdle, al nalam, which is also Arabic and literally means string of pearls, which incidentally was named several hundred years before Glenn Miller ever came up with his string. And lastly, my favorite of the three, simply because I love the way it sounds, mintaka, which also comes from the Arabic and simply means the belt. So, I suppose we could refer, loosely speaking, to all three of these stars as Orion's Mintaka, or the Mintaka of Orion. Mintaka equals belt, belt equals Mintaka. Now, I don't really know why I'm so partial to al Natak, al Nalam, and Mintaka, but perhaps it's because I was raised in Wisconsin, where I was steeped in a lot of the lore of the American Indians. And when you say al Natak, al Nalam, and Mintaka, it sounds somehow kind of very Indian-like. Like, don't you think? I mean, Mintaka is pretty close to many. Ha ha. At any rate, their unusual and humble names, in truth, betray their reality. For on close inspection, we find that Mintaka is a giant blue star whose diameter is 12 times that of our own sun, almost 12 million miles wide, and whose surface temperature is 90,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And would you believe it is 1,500 light years away from us? Meaning that the light we see tonight when we look at Mintaka is the light that left it 1,500 years ago. As for Al Nalam and Al Natak, well, they're something else. For they are not just giant blue stars, they are super giant blue stars. For each of them has a diameter 20 times larger than our own sun almost 20 million miles wide, and they each shine with a luminosity 50,000 times that of our sun. And the light we see from these two super giant blue beauties is the light which left them 1,600 years ago, when the only Americans around were indeed the American Indians. So, out under the night sky with you to look at these wondrous stars so easy to find and fun to pronounce. An ancient celestial saloon where we can all have a free celestial mintaka. That's a belt or two if we just keep looking up. Star Hustler, made possible by grants from the P.L. Dodge Foundation, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium and Museum of Science, and the Abraham Schwartz Memorial Fund. Well, there you have it. Twelve months and four seasons of the night sky. As seen from the third planet out from the sun, the planet we share, planet Earth. And might I leave you at the end of each year of viewing these episodes, with one thought. And that is, if you have come to know a little more of the universe than you did before you encountered this video, 
then please share your knowledge of the wonders of the night sky with a friend. For if the stars tell us anything, it is that we all belong to the same family who share the same feelings. And one of the most wonderful feelings of all is that incredible sense of awe and wonder of the magnificence of the cosmos. And with that, may I say, rewind me, please, for next year. And by now, you should know to keep looking up. <laughs>